60 million people got the H1N1, right? 60,000 people died. I think 600,000 people die of heart disease in this country. Uh, 540,000 people die of cancer. I haven't seen a shutdown, but probably for those things, there should be a shutdown with the increase in obesity. That's probably what we should be calling a state of emergency, but we're not doing that because more obese people, more people with heart disease, more people with cancer fuel big pharma. And we don't see a shutdown on any of that. We don't see a shutdown on the fact 1.9 million people get hospitalized every year from prescription drugs. Dr. Shiva, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Best to your whole audience out there. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. You are a man on a mission, and I have a lot of questions. So let's dig right into this. The first question I have is this. A lot of medical doctors that I've spoken to have said that this COVID-19 acts differently than other viruses. So the first question is this. Is this virus from nature, or is this virus man-made? Well, look, I think uh, the, this is all speculation unless you actually can go in and understand, you know, it's all probability, okay? I think there was one group, what do I mean by that? You know, viruses are constantly mutating, right? Um, and just to step back, you know, there, there, was a, there was a, I think a book written many, many years ago by Francis Crick, you know, one of the uh, three discoverers of DNA. The, the other was actually a woman who didn't get the credit that she deserved. But so it wasn't just two Crick and Watson. But anyway, Crick wrote a book. There's been this interesting um, uh, idea with that when you look at evolution, I don't know if you've seen this, um, that people say, wait a minute, if you look at this called a human being, right? If it came from evolution, which is a bunch of random mutations, right? According to Darwinian natural selection, um, you had you know an organism, and it was, it, it mutated, right? There was a certain series of mutations and that mutation was valuable for that environment and then it succeeded, right? But it was through constant mutations. And um, so when people did the mathematical analysis, it turns out that human beings should be around here for many more billions of years, okay? Which means the mutations, that if it was through, purely through randomness. So that led to a guy uh, called Stephen Jay Gould, who was, um, uh, you know, a... Um, paleontologist, I believe, at Harvard, who wrote a book, a series of books, and he said, well, it didn't occur like, you know, very gradually, because people weren't finding all the fossils, that it was much more punctuated, right? You had a certain type of creature, and then punctuated equilibrium took place where it just jumped, and you had another series of, or, you know, organisms. Francis Crick actually said an interesting thing, um, you know, won the Nobel Prize for discovering DNA. He said that it was spores from other planets which must have come here, because that could only explain how fast evolution took place. So anyway, the reason I'm telling that is that when you look at viruses, they too are constantly mutating, okay? So if you look at these things called a class of coronaviruses, um, they typically have, you know, if you uh, understand there's a ribonucleic acid surrounded by glycoprotein and then there's surface proteins, right? The RNA sequences in that could vary based on how they've mutated, so SARS, uh, COVID-1, right, and this is actually COVID-2 with the COVID-19 viruses is a variation of that. Also related to another one called MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, right, that one. But if you look at the nucleotides, um, some of the work has suggested, or some people have suggested that of the 1,500 base pairs that are different, that those could not have occurred through pure mutation, right? That there's too much, there's too many variations in there that could not have occurred in such a short period of time. Therefore, perhaps they were engineered, okay? But I'm saying this discussion doesn't only go back to this, it goes back to the origin of life where people try to figure out how things occurred so fast. What we do know is that that difference in that RNA sequence enables this particular virus to use a particular receptor called ACE2, um, which is the same receptor that SARS uses. However, this has a much higher um, what's called a ability to bind to that, okay? So you could say it has a much higher infectivity rate. So when the virus meets your cell, cell membranes, it's able to infect it much faster. So that explains why you have a much higher infectivity rate. Is it possible someone engineered did it? Sure, you know, is it easy? It's not as easy as you think, okay? These things are, uh, you know, you have to engineer them, you have to test it, 
but that's not to assume people did not do it, okay? But I'm telling you that there, what we can definitively know is that it has a significantly higher infectivity rate, right? So it, it, it has less friction to go through the atmosphere, meaning um, infect cell walls. It has a lower fatality rate. But that's what I can really say to that definitively. But, you know, we live in an interesting world, right? That where a lot of things can occur. And, you know, the Chinese government, um, and I'm sure our government does this too, it's more hidden, but they're a little more overt. They're not afraid of breaking a bunch of rules, right? International codes or ethics codes, we probably do it the same thing, but which, which means our deep state, but does it in a much more um, hidden way. So the, you mentioned the particular, so the ACE2 receptor, a lot of people are looking at that. The mechanism, is this mechanism something that is new or it's been around for a very long time? It's just that the infection rate is higher. I, th I, think, I think what it looks like is it looks like the infection rate is higher, right? So, you know, I, you know one of my inventions, Cytosol, you know, which is the ability where we can, can literally model molecular pathways. And if you study chemistry, if, you know, going back to basic like AP or high school chemistry, sodium plus chloride gives sodium chloride, right? Na plus Cl, and you have the little arrow, gives sodium chloride. Well, above that arrow is typically something called a rate constant, how fast that reaction occurs. So if you have the virus protein binding with the receptor, that is called a binding energy that has a rate constant, right? Based on the structure of these proteins, when it binds, you can vary that rate constant. So virus plus AC2 receptor gives a binded, you know, configuration. So um, it's clear that that rate constant is, is much, you know, occurs at a, at a much faster rate likely. That's what a lot of the data is showing much faster than SARS. So Sweden has an epi epidemiologist that came up with different numbers and it led to them not shutting down their country. And we know that the UK started to do that and then they were kind of, they changed their, their viewpoint on that. So what are your thoughts on what's going on with How's Sweden? How's Sweden doing? Is everyone dead there? No. They're still, they're still they're, alive, right? They're doing fine. <laughs> so this whole, yeah, anyway, look, 60 million people got the H1N1, right? 60,000 people died, right? Um, I think 600,000 people died of heart disease in this country. Uh, 540,000 people died of cancer. I haven't seen a shutdown, but probably for those things, there should be a shutdown with the increase in obesity. That's probably what we should be calling a state of emergency, but we're not doing that because more obese people, more people with heart disease, more people with cancer fuel big pharma. And we don't see a shutdown on any of that. We don't see a shutdown on the fact 1.9 million people get hospitalized every year from prescription drugs. But we do see a shutdown when this takes place. And the question to anyone who has common sense, and the people who don't have common sense are the educated vulnerable elites who think Fauci is doing the right thing, okay? It's very interesting to watch the behavior of these people. Um, so, you know, when you look at Sweden not shutting down, and it's very simple, you, know, it, um, you know, about on the 23rd of March, I wrote a letter to Trump and I laid out a plan. And that plan is based on modern science. In 2003, one of the profound things that took place in Western medicine was when the genome project ended, people realized, oh my God, we have the same number of genes as a worm. We don't have a half a million genes. So what makes us different than a worm is not the number of genes, it's the proteins and the molecular pathways. And that led to a field called precision and personalized medicine, which gets back to the, you know, the right food for the right person at the right time. You know. Um, so that's where that, that occurred in 2003. And even the NIH said, oh yeah, we have to do precision medicine. But when you take something like this, you should apply those same principles, even in the arena of public health. Why are we shutting down everyone? Why are we getting everyone to get mandated vaccines? That's where this is going. Why are we forcing everyone to a quarantine model? When if you step back and you look at the numbers as Sweden did, the numbers essentially show it's a very small set of people who are dying. And out of those people, the preponderance of those people have pre-existing conditions, are the elderly, and have, you know, um, are immunocompromised. Most of that from diet, you know? Most of that from diet, high sugar diets, right? Which create candida and fungus, which then go and shut down your gliotoxins. I mean, create gliotoxins, which go shut down to the most important parts of the immune system, macrophages and T cells. 
Again, this is all well studied and well written about, but we don't discuss that. Instead, what we are looking at is trying to isolate everyone, right? What we should do is take the people who are immunocompromised and maybe put them on a serious program of health and well-being, boost their immune systems. I mean, the two things I propose are things that are, I mean, there's many, many solutions. I didn't want to make it too complicated because a lot of people can't afford a lot of this, but people can afford, I think, vitamin D and vitamin A and a little bit of iodine and iodide and some vitamin C. These are you can pick up anywhere. Yes, you have to check the quality, but at least people get something in their hand. And that so, was in your letter that you sent Donald that Trump. That was in the letter. And it basically said, let's partition people. And it also pointed out that Fauci is all about one size fit all. It's like medieval medicine. He's, he's a face of big pharma. He's been the face of it for 40 years. And this is his you know, third or fourth rodeo where he creates a big fear and then he sells a pharma solution like he did with AIDS, okay? He sold AZT, right? Or these approaches which have nothing to do with recognizing most of these people have immunocompromised systems because of their lifestyle and their diet, et cetera. That was never discussed. And he still won't discuss that, which is, shows his level of fraud in many ways. That it's not about speaking about science and immune health. So when you, I think people in Sweden probably looked at the numbers and they said, why are we going to crash our whole economy, right? Why would anyone do that? Now, the only reason someone would do that is they have another agenda or they're really, really stupid, okay? So I think it's the former in Fauci's case because I think he wants to leave his you know, symbol, right? His legacy would be he's a guy who brought mandated vaccines to the world, right? That's what he's about, mandated medicine. So I think it's criminal what he's doing. And I think he should be indicted. I think he should not only be fired because if you look at his entire history, he's the one who created the bogus, completely bogus science that HIV causes AIDS, you know, and created a huge, you know, fear based on that. So he's, he knows how to do this. By the way, the NIH, not only has a science arm, they also do a lot of propaganda. You should look at their media arm, them and the CDC. They profoundly understand public opinion. They do a lot of research on how to manipulate public opinion, them and the CDC. Is vaccination, or should I say forced vaccination, a form of slavery? I think, uh, I think it's worse than that. <laughs> you know, um, because uh, it's worse than that because you know, where we are now is it's total control of your bloodstream at a fundamental level, right? And it's in a model that you can't escape anywhere, right? At least a slave could escape his plantation, go somewhere else and run, okay? At least get away. Where are you going to run in this model? Where do you run? So you're living in the United States. Let's say you can't get a driver's license. Let's say you're not able to go to your gym. You're not able to even go outside and your neighbors are actually used as a Gestapo against you. Well, how can you get on an airplane to get away anywhere? You can't really go anywhere because the other country is going to have this. So this is extraordinary what's taking place. Where do you run to? Where do you actually run? You can't really run anywhere. And so that's why this is a fundamental issue of freedom versus slavery. That's where, we're, and, it's, and it's so profound because it's occurring at a moment in history where we're right at the 20th year of our, you know, 2020, right? And some very interesting anthropologists said in the first 20 years, it's decided where, whether a nation will go or a country will go into the dark ages or the golden age. And that's where we're at. And this is going to come down to everyone waking up and realizing that we allowed this to occur, right? By, by not uh, organizing ourselves, by not recognizing that the people in power are, are, you know, power corrupts and power corrupts absolutely. That's what we're seeing. And people like Bill Gates, people like Zuckerberg, people like the Clintons, the CDC and the WHO, and the Chinese Communist Party. Think about how that country is organized. A small set of people tell everyone what to do. And so when we say made in China, we're actually exporting China to the United States, for that matter, to the rest of the world. Top-down, total control. So I think it's quite extraordinary, but the good thing is we still have a lot of people who work with their hands, who are smart, you know, people who... Uh, understand, you know, uh, how things work. And that's why I think, um, uh, Ben, the videos I put out, you know, in a very simple way explaining this have gone so viral because people know something's not right. But the academics over at MIT and Harvard, they're not going to say anything. They won't say anything because they want to live in their nice homes. They want to get their nice tenured, you know, packages. 
by the way, you know, when you get tenure, you never have to work again, right? You get a health care. You should look at the health care that these guys get. It's far more better than any one of us get. They're treated like royalty. Academics and major institutions are like the modern day priesthood. And that's what's going on. They're elite and they think they're better than us. And so that's why, you know, when I talked about earlier today, I said we need to go to a citizen science model. We need to bust up the scientific establishment. You know, in the, in the Indian model, I've talked about this, you have the priesthood on top. They're the ones who advise the kings, right? Fauci advising Trump. And then they're the ones who deployed the military, the business people, et cetera. That was a caste system. And that's what they really want to impose, a caste system. And the only way out of this is decentralization. It has to be people recognizing that this model of governance literally is about making you and I automatons in a vast network and a vast factory. So I was just telling someone before I joined this call that the, you, know, uh, you know, people talk about AI, right? It's a field that I was in for 20, 30 years. And what I realized was when you really think about AI, we've already had AI. The, the day that we created the manufacturing line, you know, you do this and you do this, you know, you're creating an iPhone and each person's doing something or the, the Ed sold the car, uh, Ford created, everyone was doing their thing. It was basically carbon-based beings doing something very simple, right? Over and over again. And Adam Smith talked about it, how this was a complete destruction to the human psyche, just being to do one thing. Well, now I think those in power have said, hmm, do I want a carbon-based being doing this or do I want a silicon-based being, right? Which is a robot. They probably may have said, you know, a silicon-based being is going to cost a lot of money. We got to develop it. We got to why don't we just make automatons of the carbon-based beings, right? Control them in such a way that I can, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the areas I do a lot of research in is control systems theory. It's how an airplane goes from point A to point B. It's how your thermostat works, right? You go off course, you nudge it back in line. Go off course, you nudge it back in line. Your thermostat does this, okay? Well, what about taking every human being, 7.2 billion people, you're off course, nudge you back in the line. Observe, in order to do that, which I wrote in this book called The Future of Email, observability, gathering data, gathering lots of data about you, and then seeing, okay, he's going off course, let him, let me give me, let him, let's give him this input to bring him back on course. So this ability to control billions of people, or maybe you don't even need that many people, right? But to control vast numbers of people, but in order to do that, you cannot have a dissenting group of people. You can't have people protesting. You can't have people trying other types of, ways on how do you take care of the body, right? Whether it be ketogenic diets, whether it be you say, I'm going to do raw food. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take vitamins. I'm going to work out, whatever, right? You got to bring everyone into alignment, you know, beautiful, quote unquote, genetically engineered foods for, for these people, right? Uh, depleted soil. So only a finite set of things can grow. And this is what Bill Gates is all about, right? But I'm sure he eats organic food for himself. I guarantee you, right? For him and his kids. So you have basically a total global elite that think, and this is, by the way, occurred over and over again in human history. This is not new. So you, you mentioned previous in a previous podcast that I was listening to that we don't necessarily have, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, we don't necessarily have a virus problem. We have an infrastructure problem, the food, the water system. Yeah. Could you, could you explain more about that? Yeah, so uh, I talked, to, you know, I have a little manifesto. If people go to shivaforsenate.com. There's a little manifesto I wrote. It's a two-pager, but it's pretty concise. So l let's just step back. I don't know, if, you know, in Massachusetts, where MIT is, right, the center of engineering, Massachusetts got an F minus minus, not an F minus, an F minus minus, 123 points out of 350 points by the you know, the American Society of Civil Engineers, okay? For infrastructure, which means Massachusetts is falling apart, okay? Now, this is in a place where MIT exists, right? Suppose you have the best minds in the world. So think about that. And what they mean by infrastructure is crumbling bridges, crumbling roads, and water systems. Now, if you step back and you understand why this is extremely important, is that in the United States, it takes 10 years to start an infrastructure project. So even though the money is allocated, there's a, there's a very interesting guy who wrote a report, Philip K. Howard, he's got a white paper out there. And he basically said it's ten. So even after we said, oh my God, we gotta solve it, we're gonna give $2 trillion to fix the infrastructure. 
from, let's say we do it on January 1st, 2020, and we said we need to go fix that entire highway system. That bridge won't even start until 2030, okay? Won't even start, forget about the development. Why? Because the politicians and the lawyer lobbies have, across both aisles have created so much paperwork. Why do they create so much paperwork? Because they, they're corrupt. Okay, I'll give you, I'll pass, give you that permit if you do this, I'll give you that permit if you do this. So the whole thing is based on corruption. So why is this important to health? Well, if you have a bridge that's falling apart and it's decaying and it has all sorts of heavy metals and it's going into the groundwater, that affects the environment, okay? That affects our water system. By the way, in Massachusetts, the water systems are, are, are destroyed, okay? They're, that's, that's what the report said. The United States got a D++. So we're talking about the physical infrastructure, the water systems. That's why you had things like Flint, Michigan, right? Mm -hmm. Because the control systems aren't there when they make changes. Then on top of so that's the water. Then you have dirty food, right? You have the companies like Monsanto. You have the amount of different chemicals that are in the environment is extraordinary. And it's not just a little bit of one chemical. It's the synergy of what little bit of lots of chemicals do in the body. It's called the ensemble effect. You know, with our technology, as I mentioned, Cytosol, we actually use it to understand how combinations of ingredients work. Even though you have a little bit of this and a little bit, it's a cocktail of poisons. What do they do? And then you have dirty air. The Paris Accords, which was the biggest scam that was done, you know, people partied all day in Paris thinking they're saving the environment. Go read it. It allows China to double their pollution. They're incentivized to double their pollution from 11 billion carbon metric tons to 22 billion. And in 2030, there's a really cool video I did just with pen and paper. It's called the Paris Accords. If people go to truthfreedomhealth.com, I put all my videos up there. But it's a little 15-minute video. I think four, three million, four million people have seen it. But I explain the entire Paris Accord scam. So they created the boogeyman called CO2, and then their solution was carbon credits. Well, there's and part of that was we want you to pollute China because after 2030 you'll have so much pollution you're going to have to buy carbon credits to offset that and the price of carbon credits will have escalated on the stock market, okay? Or carbon equity, okay? So that's what we have. So it's always a fake problem and a fake solution to make trillionaires out of people. So you have, and by the way, pollution is the number one source of death globally, okay? In the United, I think 7 million to 7 to, 16, 7 to 15 million people die globally based on how you look at the numbers. So you have dirty air, dirty water, dirty food. And on top of this, you have, I think in the United States, 54% of kids have autoimmune disorders. One out of five kids has some mental, has mental, you know, has some, has a mental problem in some ways, okay? So that's what we've created. Now, take this century and go back 100 years to the 1900s or to the late 1800s. As I've talked about, it, you know, we had the factories were filthy places every day people worked in, you know? The elites didn't work there. And it was the militant rise of the American working class. They got angry and they built movements. And it's out of those massive militant movements, those angry vociferous movements, you had the ending of child labor, you had nutrition, you had vitamin A, right? You got sanitation, refrigeration, that precipitously brought down infectious disease long before vaccines. Well, I would argue we're at the same place. We have infrastructure issues, and infrastructure is the most immediate way if you wanted to address diseases, right? You look at an infrastructure in the way how the healthcare system, and I include that as a part of this. The healthcare system is highly centralized. You have massive layers of corruption, you, that incentivizes sickness. It's not incentivizing health. So that infrastructure is destroyed. You have the physical infrastructure of what I've talked about, dirty air, dirty water, dirty food. But politicians know they can't. The thing is, the politicians are like the, you know, the snake, the Eurobor snake biting its own tail. They don't know what the hell to do because remember I told you the statistics in Massachusetts F minus minus for infrastructure? Yep. Correlated to that is corruption. Massachusetts got a D plus plus for integrity, which means one of the top 10 worst corrupt uh, states. So this is in the state that has MIT and Harvard and all this, you know, people are supposed to be writing papers on ethics and how to create the Renaissance man and all this nonsense. This is the state that is the top 10 most corrupt and got the worst top three in infrastructure. So people say, wow, that's, that doesn't make any sense. No, it makes absolute sense because the deep state 
I would argue, is in Massachusetts. That's where all of this began. If you think about it, the American Revolution, when it was won here, they didn't, the, the elites, the blue bloods, the so-called upper caste, didn't get up and leave for London. They embedded themselves here. They hated the fact that the peasantry got even a few you know, gains, right? Bill of Rights and a couple of rights. They hated that. And so ever since then, they've been continuing to want to impose their will. Remember, there was a time when there were certain people who thought that they got their, uh, their gift from God, right? The king. This, is, this occurred in our culture, you know, two, 300 years ago. There was a king who thought that his power came from God. Think about that. So to think there are not elites who think the same way, you know, um, is almost foolish because it basically says you want to be screwed. You have to think that these people actually think they're better. You know, I've, you know, I've been at MIT, I've lived out in Hollywood, I've seen these people. They actually think they're better. And they don't think a lot of good about everyday people. They think they're better than all of us. And that caste model needs to be understood. And you know, you could, it goes beyond race even, it goes much even deeper. And that's what we're experiencing, a set of people who think they can pull a fast one. That's what's going on. And um, that's what we're witnessing right now. And it's, it's for us to wake up. And, and one simple way, you, you know, I know you try to do this in your way, Ben, is to, for people to understand that their body is a very amazing system, that the body actually follows principles of nature, right? We can, we can uh, manage it by what we put in. It's one of the few things we have control over. That's why force vaccinating everyone is a violation of like the last oasis we have which is controlling what we put into ourselves. So you said we have a defining moment here where 2020 just started and we could go on into the dark ages or we could go on into the golden ages. Right now with how things are going, it seems like we're headed towards the dark ages unless there's something to stop that and get into the golden ages. So what can we do to get it into that direction? Well, what we're doing right now, right? What you're doing right now, right? Which is, um, you know, uh, it's very interesting. When I grew up, my grandmother says, you know what your name is? And I, and I said, Shiva. She goes, you know what that means, right? And well, Shiva carries, and all of us are in some ways have, all of us have this within us. He carries a trident, okay? And, and the goal is you pierce darkness. People say, oh, Shiva's a destroyer. It's actually the destruction of ignorance right, where you take that spear and you stick it into the darkness and light comes through, okay? So now that can manifest in many ways. So a simple way that all of us can do is to overcome our own ignorance. And in this case, it's a huge opportunity to pierce that darkness of what is the immune system. Let's start there. Is the immune system so weak that it can't handle all these microbes and viruses around us? Did we get here, you know, by being so weak, you know, think about all the stuff we go through. Think about, I mean, when I was in Africa, it was quite interesting. You know, you go to Africa and you look out and you see these apes and you see these monkeys and you see, you know, um, uh, the elephants and you look at it and you say, oh my God, if you believe in evolution, we, we came from that. Okay. We were there scratching ourselves, you know, with all sorts of parasites on us, right? We came out of that. And now we live in this, right? So if we could go from that to here, imagine where else we could go. So, so it's a huge opportunity. But the reality is we can handle a lot. The human body can frankly handle an incredible amount of stresses if we don't weaken it, right? Weakening, weakening it meaning if you stay in these pristine environments, you don't go out, you don't experience uh, the sun, you don't experience dirt, right? These things strengthen the body. So if you want to weaken the body, continue high sugar diets, continue taking, uh, you know, surgical and, and uh, you know, pharmaceutical interventions are your only way, right? The average 82 year olds on 12 different drugs, the average 82 year old, God knows what all the drug drug interactions are. So we've created a biopharmaceutical economy vaccinated. Like, like that's the only way Like you surely can't do it with food. That's why when I put this vitamin DNA, I mean, chloroquinones, you know, they could be a temporary solution. 
but it's like vitamin D are too simple. You say the simple solutions, you know, people don't want to enjoy those in power do not want to enjoy because it takes away their power. You know, doing cleanses once in a, you know, when change of seasons take place, every culture did this. Um, you know, fasting, you know, the, every culture did this. This is not something that was, uh, you know, not the norm. It was the norm. It's how people over centuries learned how to take care of ourselves. But yet we think we should listen to a guy who stole DOS from somebody, built a company that was brought to him by his mama and papa, you know? And that's who we're following. And another guy, Zuckerberg, two Harvard dropouts, okay? Which is cheeky to be, right? But they're part of this entire military industrial complex. And that's who we're supposed to listen to and bow down to. And that's, those are the kinds of people that we should be destroying out of our lives because they're the people who want to deny our humanity as though they're the only ones who have the truth. And they don't. Their model is, and look at what they've done. They create foundations, as I've talked about. What, are, what is a foundation? It's a way to evade taxes. And yet they, yet they present themselves as saviors of humanity. So they take billions of dollars out of tax dollars, put it into their own foundations, which they pass on to their kids, and yet they preach to us that they're against estate, estates and legacy planning, right? I mean, even if they give away their money, they're giving it to their own clique, their own cabal, which then will dictate public policy independent of, you know, democracy. So they're going to run their own governments here. That's what they're doing. That's what these foundations are. They're basically going to take vast amounts of money, which should be going to the public coffers, evade taxes, and then they're going to tell us what to do. We need fighters. At the end of the day, Ben, what we need is we need people to rise up. We need to create people who will fight and who will say, no, you're not better than me. And I'm a human being. And the, 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 the traditional history, the traditional medicines people have also have value. And these are the same people who speak a lot about they're against racism and therefore diversity and inclusivity, all these words, yet they do not want to include, you know, 5,000 years worth of knowledge of indigenous medicines, right? So they're, they're actually the real racists, these so-called liberals. They are the true racists. So you, you have a petition. Tell us more about that. How could we support that? Yeah, so what we've done is we, we put out a petition um, and it's called Fire Fauci. And I think it got over 20,000 signatures in, wow. in, in, uh, less, in about 40, uh, 36 hours. It's up there. Our server was being hit so hard. We're actually upgrading our server now. Okay. Um, we had 40,000, but you can see, let me bring it up. Oh my God. It was, it's gone up. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, let me see there. 24,000. I see. Yeah, and you can look who's number one, a doctor. You see that? Oh, yeah, amazing. So we have close to, now, I think it's probably close to 600 to 1,000 doctors. Wow. Okay? So, because there are a lot of medical professionals out there who know that they went into a profession to want to help people. You know, many people I know, and they come out of it, and they go, you know what, what did I do with my life? I know this is wrong, but I have to do this, other, because they are beholden to their medical boards, it's almost like they have no freedom themselves. So the doctors have no freedom and they don't want to give you freedom because they're basically, they're, they're, they're essentially, they're also constrained because they're basically owned by big pharma and big insurance. Every protocol that they do, you know, they could get sued if they don't do the right thing. And every protocol that they do has been calculated through some, um, uh, you know, quote unquote scholar at McKinsey or Anderson, one of the big consulting companies. They've mapped all this out. They've done the spreadsheets to optimize how much revenue that'll generate for pharma, right? Everything's been sort of organized. Eventually, they don't even need the MDs because the MDs are basically following. Now, uh, surgeons are a little bit different. Surgeons actually have to solve problems. But I feel very bad for most of the MDs out there. A lot of good people um, who went into wanting to do a noble profession, and they're basically, they have golden handcuffs right now. I know you have to run. Um, but, but I have the, one, one, I'm sorry. The, yeah. the, the petition was really about engaging and, and um, I think we're going to let it run for a little while. I, I want to get it up to 100,000, you know? And this, we're not using change.org. We built our own technology here to do this. But it, uh, do you want me to read what we wrote in here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what we wrote in here was, this is for everyone to sign. So if you go to shivaforsenate.com, you can go to the, uh, in fact, what I'll do is, 
let me just, uh, I will re, I think it's retweeted if people are on Twitter. Um, but if you can go, you can find this petition on Shiva for Senate. And I'm going to, uh, it's got about, it's right on the top. I'm sorry. It's right on top. If you go to my Twitter feed, it's the first thing that comes up there. Okay. Got it. You pinned it at the top. Okay. It's right on top. We'll make sure we'll put that in the notes of yeah. this po podcast. Yeah. too. But basically the, the letter basically consolidates some of the elements of what I wrote to the president, which said, so when people sign up, they're saying, I'm signing this petition to sincerely request your administration immediately indict and fire Anthony Fauci. I agree with Dr. Shiva Iadre's assessment, which he stated in a letter to you on March 23rd, 2020, that, quote, the current, current trajectory of Dr. Anthony Fauci's public, quote unquote, health policy will result in the short and long-term destruction of the citizens, of our citizens' immune health, as well as our nation's economic health. So to your point, I think uh, Sweden uh, took this into account. Do you know when they decided not to do lockdown? No, I don't. Okay, so Dr. Fauci's policy at best is based on a 1950s outdated one size fit all non-personalized approach to medicine and public health. And at worst is derived from a fake science understanding of the immune system. One which Dr. Fauci over five decades has perpetuated and exploited to build his career. Dr. Fauci has significant and deep conflicts of interest with big pharma that has a singular aim, force uh, medical mandates. By the way, it's vaccines today. Tomorrow it could be everyone must eat these diets, right? Or you limit them in such a way, or you can't get, find certain things in the store that you need, right? You outlaw vitamin D. Think about that. Start outlawing, outlawing MCT oil, right? Just think about where the precedents, I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but right, once right. you start mandating medicine, you, you enter into a whole uh, interesting world. Um, um, big Pharma is failing and is an economic pair of forced and mandated vaccines are the only path for Big Pharma's future. During Dr. Fauci's tenure, America have, has been led down a path of corporate solutions delivering policies that have led America to the lowest longevity rates and the highest infant mortality rates in the Western world. In the current situation, purposely driven by fear mongering and fake science, Dr. Fauci's allies in Big Pharma, the Gates Foundation, Clinton Global Initiative, Chan Zuckerberg, WHO, CDC, and the Chinese Communist Party will profit enormously, both politically and economically, at the expense of the American working people. It's time we focus on the immune health of the American people, which Big Pharma has zero interest in advancing. It's time we fire and indict Anthony Fauci to send a much needed and long awaited signal to his Big Pharma allies. Thank you. So that we have 24,511 people have signed in literally uh, 48 hours. And this podcast way, will come out soon and we'll, we'll have that on there so you get more signatures. Go ahead. Yeah, by the way, Fauci, uh, I guess he had his people, um, you know, by the way, this guy's a PR, he knows what he's doing, okay? Um, has people trying to get him to be the sexiest man alive on People Magazine. And I think they've only had about 9,000 signatures and after 10 days, we got 24,000 in two days. So we're hitting an important chord that's already in the consciousness of people that they want to be able to have a, a great life for their kids and their future, right? And that begins with food and clean air and clean water. So it, when you get the 100,000 signatures, what is that? What is, are they forced at that point to look at this case? What does well, that do? Well, well we're going to, I think what we should do is we should, you know, we're going to send all those signatures to the president. And if need be, we may even hold an online rally, okay, of all those people. You know, if we can't be out, you know, um, there are tools that we can do that with. So I'm thinking about what to do, do that with. But we need to take that fire, which is worldwide right now. And if people can't do it individually, let's do it online. I did a poll just real quick on my Instagram. It should we, would, should we stop the shutdown? And about 75% of the people said, no way. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think this message is, it needs to get out there because yeah. you and I both believe that the human body this is was on your Instagram post on my, on my Instagram story mm -hmm. today. I said, I was going to interview you. Do you believe you said, and about 75% or so I got to check it now, but 75% when I checked yeah. it said, no way. And the other awesome. 15, 15, 20% said yes. Uh, yeah. um, and we know, you and I know that the human body is the greatest physician in the world, this innate intelligence within us. So I've taken up a lot of your time. Uh, I want to thank you for the work that you're doing. You're showing up. You're very courageous. Uh, we are praying for your safety. We're praying for this message to be heard. And we'll, we'll release this podcast as soon as possible in, in 48 hours turnaround. We'll put all your links in the notes above, uh, below. Yeah, let me know when you've done it, Ben. And then we'll retweet. If you want us to restream it, we can do that.
Yeah, I will. I'll send you some okay. social media assets. Final words you want to share real quick? Look, I think the final word is this. Um, it's time that we realize that when situations like this take place, by the way, you know, the American Revolution only had 4% of the people who led it, okay? Um, and when you look at any organizational system, many, many years ago, I gave a, a talk with a guy called Price Pritchett, who's considered one of the leading organizational theorists. Yeah, he, I was running you another, squared. huh? You squared, I love his work. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so um, Price and I were giving a talk to a room full of 2,500 GM executives. This is when General Motors was having major problems. And they invited, you know, different thought leaders. And I was running a company for, you know, um, analyzing email and data and this kind of stuff for inbound customer service, how you could better optimize your relation with your customers. So in his talk, he asked this audience, um, what percent, and if you take any organization, community, what percentage of that organization um, is resistors? People want to keep things the way they are. They don't want to change. What percentage of the people are fence sitters, which means they watch which way the wind blows, and what percentage are change agents? Mm. And he did studies of all different kinds of organizations, primitive cultures, you know, advanced cultures. And the number he came out with was quite fascinating, is that it turns out 30%, if you, even, if you do a startup, you know, or you do any, 30% are resistors. They don't want to change. They want to keep things the way they are. 50% are fence sitters. They watch which way the wind blows. 20% are the change agents. Now, he said, okay, this is, and this, remember, GM's having a horrible time. They're not being able to prosper, et cetera. And he said, what, he goes, if you are a manager and you want to be a change agent, what's a typical mistake people make? And it turns out that the typical manager or change agent spends 80% of their time trying to convince the 30% of resistors you're never gonna change them. And in fact, he said, you need to get rid of these people fast. They will destroy your organization. He said, you need to be like a Doberman, ferocious. And many companies don't do this, okay? That's why they fail organizations. And that, so he said the 20%, you know, the ch people wanna lead should focus on their 20%, you know, empowering them, because when you make them stronger, you bring over the other 50%. You follow what I'm saying? So when you look at your poll, it isn't that far off. It's yeah, about yeah. 75 to 80 percent. Okay, it's pretty close. 20 to 25 percent are the change agents. But the issue is, how do we bring these other people over? Okay, and that's why I think these videos are going viral because people are saying I didn't have the tools, right? And the reason they didn't have the tools is because the scientific establishment, which is supposed to be doing this job, is not. They're all bought and paid for. So by doing these videos, you know, by teaching people what is the immune system, by educating people on system thinking, you know, so, you know, when people go and donate, that's why, you know, part of my running for Senate is I want to use that as a platform to, if there's a subversive intent, it is to educate people on how system thinking takes place, how your body is a system. That's why we said, okay, give 25 bucks, we'll give you a book and we'll give you how to understand the body as a system. And people can actually start understanding these dynamics. And when people do that, they'll say, wait a minute, right? My body is an interconnected system. I can move it in different ways. I can become an expert of my own body, all right? So that's what the goal really is, is that for people to recognize that they, they, you know, it is not the left or the right. These are not Republican or Democrat issues. When it comes to health, it's something that's a universal issue that affects everyone. So anyway, that's what people should really think about you know, when they think about it, how you take a systems approach to the body. Thank you so much for that and the work Thank that you. you're doing. Thanks, I'll, I'll make sure I get this out as soon as possible okay. and I'll send it your way. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, man. Okay.